welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the Madden America podcast. And this week we turn our attention to electroconvulsive therapy or electroshock as it's known in the US. And it's fair to say that ECT remains a controversial subject with proponents and detractors regularly disagreeing on its safety and efficacy. The number of psychiatrists willing to administer ECT, particularly in the UK, is in decline, but we are still using it to administer electric shocks to the brains of an estimated 2,000 people each year. In this episode, we discuss a recent paper from the journal Ethical Human Psychology and Psychiatry, and it's written by John Reed, Irving Kirsch, and Laura McGrath. And I'm delighted that two of the three authors have joined me to discuss the paper, its conclusions, and the reception to the findings. Later on, we'll hear from Professor of Psychology Irving Kirsch, and in particular, we'll focus on the role of placebo in the administration of ECT. But first, I'm really pleased to get another chance to chat with Professor of Psychology John Reid from the University of East London. John worked for nearly 20 years as a clinical psychologist and manager of mental health services in the UK and the USA before joining the University of Auckland, New Zealand in 1994, where he worked until 2013. He has published over 140 papers in research journals, and his interests include the relationship between adverse life events and psychosis, the experience of recipients of antipsychotic and antidepressant drugs, and the role of the pharmaceutical industry in mental health research and practice. Okay, John, welcome. Thank you again for taking the time to chat for the Madden America podcast. And uh, we're here to discuss a recent paper of yours, which is co-written with Irving Kirsch and Laura McGrath. And the title is Electroconvulsive Therapy for Depression, a review of the quality of ECT versus sham ECT trials and meta-analyses. To begin, I wondered if you could tell us a bit about the paper itself and, and what, what was the question that you were trying to answer with your work? Yeah, hi, James. Good to be with you again. Um, yeah, that, that title is a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? The origins of the of paper, was, was that, as you probably know, we've done uh, several reviews of the ECT literature before, always finding that there is no evidence that it's better than placebo. But uh, often the response was, Yes, but there's these meta-analyses there that show the opposite, John. So what are you talking about? So we thought it would be useful to actually, um, yes, look at the studies again, but also look at the quality of the meta-analyses. There there were four when we set out, and there was a fifth one done right at the last minute, which I'll come on to. So we wanted to um, try and understand how these uh, meta-analyses kept concluding that ECT works. When the studies they're using were such poor quality, uh, in our view, that um, we thought you couldn't really reach any conclusion. So that that was the question: Is this is the literature, the eleven studies, and there's only been eleven that have ever compared ECT with sham ECT? And just to explain that, sham ECT or simulated ECT is when you administer the, the general anaesthetic, but you withhold the electricity and therefore the convulsion. Um, and that is the, a proper placebo control group for um, an ECT placebo study. There's only ever been 11 of those. And um, we wanted to look at whether they were of good enough quality to merit being included in meta-analysis. And we wanted to look at whether the meta-analysis had shown any interest in the quality of the studies they were reviewing. So that, that was the... Um, that was the motivation for the paper. Uh, and, and given that a huge amount of this is all about placebo, I was absolutely delighted that, that the, lead, the world's leading expert on placebo effects within mental health, Professor Erwin Kirsch from Harvard Medical School, uh, came on board and did it uh, with us. That's, uh, that was very, very important. I was interested to read you. You developed a 24-point rating scale, didn't you, for... Uh, for assessing the quality of the trials. And not only that, I think I'm right in saying that the, you scored them independently and those scores were blinded from each other. Is that right? That's right. We, that was a 24-point scale, which, in, uh, which included five there's five basic Cochrane criteria uh, that you have to use when you uh, uh, do a, a meta-analysis 
to evaluate the study. And we added um, 19 ad- additional ones, which were, some of which were specific to, to ECT. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm being aware of my bias going in. Um, I asked my colleague, uh, Dr. McGrath, who um, had no particular interest in ECT and no particular knowledge around it, to rate the studies on those 24 uh, blind to my ratings. And uh, interestingly, she came out with even worse ratings than I did. We had some disagreements and discussed them. And by the end, we, we rated them. The average rating was higher than either of our individual ratings. So we tried to be as generous as possible. In fact, uh, Professor Richard Bentel has written a commentary on our review and, and, and said we were we were very generous in our ratings. For instance, we we said studies were large enough if they had at least 10 in each group, in the ECT and control group. And he pointed out that's tiny. Um, but we were we were bending over backwards, really, not to be biased against the ECT and to try and give quality scores. If there was any you know, shadow of doubt, we would, we would give it a tick. And having done all of that, um, the out of 24, I think the average was 13 point something. And most of them really were nowhere near the standard that any uh, would be included in meta-analysis in any other discipline. Yeah, it's it's I think it's fair to say from reading the uh the conclusions the quality of evidence presented is pretty unimpressive all told even taking into account there haven't been any recent studies. Yeah, I mean people can say well, it's not it's not fair to hold these older studies to account because we didn't have the same standards then but that, in a way that's the whole point. We haven't had a study since 1985. That's 35 years without a single um, robust study into whether ECT works. Studies overall do get better in design as scientists learn better ways to study things. Um, But those those studies were particularly shoddy. And and apart from the tiny size, one of the most important things was that none of them were double blind in in that sort of a basic uh, Cochrane review criteria for inclusion in uh, meta-analysis. And the reason they weren't double-blind was that you, the, the, some of them did blind the people doing the ratings. Uh, some didn't even manage to do that. But some, some did. But you can't blind the patients unless they have never had ECT before. Because if you have had ECT before, you know that you always wake up with a headache and confusion for a few hours. So you know which group you're in. So you can't double blind unless you make sure that nobody in your study has had ECT before. And not one of the 11 studies did that. So that was just one of the 24 criteria. There were, there were so many others. There was a lot of selective reporting. For instance, one study um, asked the psychiatrists, the nurses, and the patients to rate the effectiveness. And the study only reported the psychiatrists' rating and just put the other one, the other two ratings in the bin. They just didn't report them. Another one was more honest to report and reported both the psychiatrist and the patient's ratings. And the psychiatrist uh, found a, uh, an effect. In, in other words, it was better than placebo, but the patients didn't, um, which I which we found interesting. Um, it just goes to the, this idea that the placebo effect can work on the prescriber as well as the person receiving a treatment. So, but but I could go on and on, but um, I'll go through all the 24 criteria. But the studies were just of an appalling quality and and how really any of them got included in serious meta-analysis is, is, is a wonder. Um, and then you go on to the meta-analyses themselves and they were so, so sort of arbitrary in which ones they included. So these five meta-analyses included between one and seven of the 11 studies. Um, so there was no, no, no pattern. There was just picking and choosing um, at some, in some sort of arbitrary, arbitrary way. So the studies were of appallingly low standard, and the meta-analyses also did not come close to looking like what most people would accept as a reasonable meta-analysis. And John, your your paper made an interesting recommendation right at the very end. So I, I wondered if you could share that with us. Our question was: Is the data used by these meta-analyses good enough to answer the question, "Does ECT work?" And and the answer to that question very clearly: No. 
Um, so we're not actually saying we know that it doesn't work. We're saying we don't know whether it works. Uh, and that's after 80 years. There isn't any evidence that it does work. But the, the point is the studies were so poor that we don't know. Um, and that wouldn't matter if it wasn't for this other issue of the amount of brain damage and memory loss that putting that amount of electricity through people's brains inevitably causes. Now, the research in that area has been so poor that we don't actually know exactly how many people get permanent or persistent memory loss. The studies range from 12.5% up to 55%, um, which is you know, a minimum of one in eight people getting permanent or persistent memory loss is, is pretty high. Um, and in studies when you ask patients rather than psychiatrists, they, that's those are the ones that get up to about 55%. So this is an appallingly bad cost-benefit analysis. So our conclusion was that given all of that, ECT has to be suspended until proper studies are carried out that would establish whether there is any benefit to weigh against the brain damage and memory loss. Because at the minute, all we know is the memory loss. We don't know if there's any benefit. Um, so we're calling for an immediate suspension. We don't expect that will happen overnight. I was really pleased to see the media picked up quite a lot on this. And I saw many headlines in the BBC and, and elsewhere. And they echoed your line about ECT must be suspended until a more rigorous study can be done to prove its effectiveness. And I was also really interested to see the social media back and forth on this because I saw, you know, I genuinely saw some psychiatrists saying, thank you, John, I hadn't realized how unevidenced this procedure was. But then I saw these, you know, refutations and all my experiences, it works, but nowhere in any of those responses did I see any evidence provided that refuted your study. No, and that's because there isn't any. Um, and <laughs> I do know this literature inside. Out. There are, there, there are um, people will refer to other types of studies where you compare different types of ECT with one another, or you compare ECT to antidepressants, and that's that's all well and good. But we've reviewed all of that as well in a 2017 paper, and there's nothing there that suggests ECT is better than placebo. And that, that has to be the gold standard when it comes to um, deciding whether or not something should be used, especially when it is, has got so many dangerous side effects. You have to establish that it is at least better than placebo. And, and there isn't any, just isn't any evidence for that. Yeah, some of the stuff on, on Twitter and, and social media got very silly. There's a, there's a number of, unfortunately, rather senior psychiatrists who think they sort of personal attacks on me, attacks on the journal attacks on other people who tweeted to support the journal. Um, that's un unfortunate and best to be ignored. It's the same It's the same five or six psychiatrists that get, get on, and they did the same when we published our review of antidepressant withdrawal. And the, the goal is to just sort of degrade and diminish and minimize and, and not engage in proper debate. I mean, there is proper debate to be had. I mean, no review is, no review is perfect. Um, to be fair, one psychiatrist did say that 24-point scale, has it been, uh, has its reliability been tested before? That's a good question, and the answer is no. So that sort of methodological critique and rigor is absolutely appropriate and part of the scientific process. But name-calling and this, this it's just the sort of childish labeling, name-calling game that um, most psychiatrists are above, but there is this sort of small group of people who get on social media and just, uh, it's not very helpful, really. I just best leave it at that, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and so you, you um, mentioned there a little bit about next steps in terms of writing to NICE and, you know, inviting the Royal College to be part of that process. So, you know, is there anything else kind of going on in, you know, in and around this, which, uh, you know, could make a difference? So we're uh, very pleased uh, at the Royal College's response in terms of they've, they've said that they're going to update their ECT position statement, um, having looked at our uh, review, and they will consider our review in, in that process. So that was uh, 
that was a very welcome response from from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And um, just as importantly, um, NICE have said that they are uh, they will consider the implications of the review in the current update that they're doing of their depression guidelines, because there are two or three specific recommendations about when ECT can and can't be used in their depression guidelines, and they're redoing those at the minute. And they had already, even before I emailed them, they had uh, they said they're already aware of the review, and they were definitely will be looking at those ECT recommendations as a result of of the review. So that's very very encouraging. Thank you, John. That that's encouraging. And if the UK were to go ahead and and make changes, do you think there'd be any influence then on what the US might do regarding ECT? Well, we we can only hope so. I mean, countries do watch one another uh, these regulatory authorities. So. Hopefully, the FDA would would be interested in in what the uh, British government's guidelines say. Um, We'll certainly be sending the review to the Food and Drug Authority and to the American Psychiatric Association, so fingers crossed. There's a a, a set of issues that's come up in the last few days where a few of my, I wasn't really involved in this, but a few of my colleagues have uh, sort of been prompted by our review to look at what patients are being told about ECT by our NHS trusts. And they've they've identified some really very disturbing information leaflets that some quite a few trusts are putting out. Things like ECT corrects a chemical imbalance that is causing depression, and which is wrong on so many levels. Uh, the Royal College really needs to intervene quite quickly and get those those leaflets removed. That is that is very irresponsible disinformation. I saw another one that I think it said. Uh, complications only arise in one in 50,000, I think it was, which was just, um, that's very negligent. So there is some very poor information being given to patients currently, so that needs to be addressed, and, and there are some people onto that quite quickly, writing to these trusts, insisting that that sort of information be withdrawn and replaced with evidence-based information. But these are like um, sort of both practical Things sort of issues we identified when we did an audit of the uh, how ECT is used in in England, which we published three or four years ago. And there's a lot of very practical issues where where trusts are actually breaking the law in terms of um, how they are administering it, um, what sort of people are being used to give second opinions because there's clear law about that in the Mental Health Act. Um, how many people are being offered psychological therapies before they get ECT? That's at an unacceptably low level. Um, so there's a lot of, of those sorts of issues where people are continuing, continually trying to apply pressure. But the, the problem with those sorts of issues are that ECT is probably monitored by the Royal College of Psychiatry, which which is, puts them in an impossible position because that is a blatant conflict of interest. And of course, they never discredit any of the ECT units. They've just put out their new guidelines, interestingly, within hours of our review being published. And there's a slight improvement. This is the, I'm talking about ECTAS now, they, that's the ECT accreditation service run by the Royal College of Psychiatry. They've slightly improved some of their criteria, um, but they still have, in terms of monitoring efficacy, the criteria for getting accredited is that it has to be monitored by, the efficacy has to be rated by the person giving the ECT. Um, and it's only an aspirational goal to use any sort of research-based scale, like a Hamilton Depression scale or anything like that. It's also still only an aspirational goal to do any follow-up. So until we have an independent body monitoring ECT, we're going to continually have problems with taking seriously the process of evaluating whether this thing works and, and seriously evaluating the cognitive um, adverse effects, but that's 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 the sort of ongoing practical issues about how EC, how ECT is being administered at the moment. So the next steps, really, while we're hopefully moving towards a, a suspension of this treatment pending the necessary high quality research that we urgently need, um, the next steps are to uh, ask Nice to open up a, a review of their current guidelines which are not really evidence-based. We're not clear where they got their research, what research they were using when they 
recommend ECT for life threatening situations because there is not a single study that shows it's that it saves lives or prevents suicide. So it'll be interesting to see um, what research they use. Nice, as you know, has been in the last couple of years quite, uh, I, I, let me be, choose my words carefully, more evidence based in the field of mental health than it has been for the last couple of decades. Where I think they've been, they have been more, uh, have been overly influenced by drug companies and so forth. But the, the current regime at Nice, I'm, I'm quite encouraged by. Um, and I'm, that's, I'm basing that partly on their uh, how they've changed their guidelines around antidepressant withdrawal when the new evidence came out. That was very refreshing and encouraging. I think when people read this 40-page report, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to hold on to old positions like it saves lives and um, and we know it works and all of that because there just isn't any evidence to support that. So people in the future, people who adopt that position, and, and it is a dwindling number, a dwindling number of psychiatrists who still think ECT works. Most people, most psychiatrists won't touch it with a barge pole, let's be clear about that, so give them their due. It's a small number of, and a, and a dwindling number of enthusiasts who still believe that it works. And, and th- they base that on good faith on the fact that they do, they do see people who haven't spoken or eaten start speaking and eating sometimes. They don't see them um, a month later or two months later, unfortunately, when they're just as depressed or more so than they were when they had the ECT. But they do it in good faith. But the point is, if they're willing to be open-minded enough to read this report that has received so much attention, if they get to the end of that, um, they've really got a choice about whether they want to throw away evidence-based medicine and just continue to rely on their own personal opinion or um, really reconsider, because it is a very, very careful, thorough report, looking at the 11 studies in great detail, the five meta-analyses in great detail, and there isn't any evidence there. So when they get to the end of that, they'll have to make their own personal decision about whether they want to be a part of evidence-based medicine or a part of anecdotal-based medicine. And I, I have some hope that most of them, they might be a bit surprised and it might be a difficult decision to make, but most of them will at least start questioning um, their faith in this, this, um, in this treatment. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as always, John, thank you, know, thank you for calmly setting out the science on this because you know to read that the number of people still getting this treatment is pretty high that's worrying isn't it we're down well just to be clear we're down to there's no good estimate no good accurate um figure but the best estimate is is about two and a half thousand a year some people saying even lower in in england so it's coming down steadily i think in 10 years time we'll be able to look back on ect the same way as we now look back on lobotomies and surprise baths and all the other things we've done to try and help depressed people, like standing them next to cannons and so forth. Uh, I think we're nearly there. I think another 10 years and, and um, it will be in the same dustbin of, of treatments that people genuinely thought were useful at the time and, and some fought to defend right to the bitter end. But um, in the end, I think good sense will prevail. Your report will certainly accelerate that process. So, John, thank you. It's always such a pleasure to talk, and I, you know, I'm very grateful for your work. And uh, you know, I know that people will get a lot from hearing this. So, thank you so much. Thanks, James. Nice to be with you as always. And now we move on to chat with Professor Irving Kirsch. Irving is associate director of the program in placebo studies and lecturer in medicine at the Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He is also Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the Universities of Plymouth and Hull in the UK and the University of Connecticut in the US. He has published 10 books and more than 250 scientific journal articles and book chapters on placebo effects, antidepressant medication, hypnosis and suggestion. Irving, thank you so much for taking the time to join us again for the Madden America podcast. And we're here to... um, discuss a recent paper of yours co-authored with John Reed and Laura McGrath. And um, I spoke earlier with John Reed about the process followed and, and the conclusions drawn from the work. But one area that I'd like to ask you about is, is the effect of placebo and, and how it operates in ECT. 
from the paper, I, I, I kind of read that clearly placebo has a role in the patient's expectations of treatment. But I, I was interested, is there a placebo role in the treating doctor's expectations too? Well, yes. And, and one of the things that we know in the placebo literature is uh, there have been some studies showing that if you change the expectations of the doctors who are administering the treatment, you can increase the placebo effect. In, so that somehow gets communicated to the patients. Um, it's somewhat reminiscent of an old, old study that had to do with, with a uh, horse that could apparently do simple mathematical problems. And the horse could do it if the person asking the question knew the answer and was expecting the horse to be able to do it. And somehow the person was unconsciously transmitting information that led the horse to stamp its foot the right number of, of, of times. So what we know now, and that research that that has led to with humans, first in the area of dentistry, is that if the clinician believes something is going to be effective, that somehow gets transmitted to the patient. And we don't know the mechanisms exactly. It may have to do with tone of voice, facial expression, things of that nature, but that, that affects the patient's expectations and the outcome of the treatment. I should also mention that placebo effects can be very large and they can be long uh, lasting and different placebos have different effects. And that's particularly important with respect to this uh, paper and the issue of uh, ECT. We know, for example, that placebo capsules are more effective than placebo pills. And placebo injections are more effective than either pills or capsules. And placebo surgery is the most effective placebo of all. And there have been studies in which they use sham surgery just as in the uh, ECT area, they use sham ECTs. Um, and those, when you have an invasive, the more invasive the procedure, the greater the placebo effect that that placebo has. And that's what you see. That's, the, I think, the best way to explain the data that we are seeing in, in, on ECT. And, and I, I'm guessing that placebo... I mean, obviously, like many people, I'm more familiar with a placebo as as a pill or as a, you know, as a physical thing rather than a, you know, a preparation for a, a surgery. I'm guessing that a placebo is probably quite a f hard thing to control for in any kind of study because, you know, doctors, of course, want to care for their patients and want to make sure that their patients are comfortable before they have any procedure. So, you know, it's it's difficult to imagine how the influence of placebo could be ruled out. Well, what you do, you have to have a placebo control condition. In the case of ECT, that would be the sham ECT. And ideally, it's a condition in which neither the doctor nor the patient knows which procedure is uh, being used, whether it's the sham or the, the real uh, procedure. No, they know that they might be getting a sham. They might be getting or giving uh, a real, the real treatment. With some treatments, that's a big problem. When you can do that, when you can do that, then you can have a good way of ruling out, the, looking at the real treatment effect, which is the difference between the response to the real treatment and the response to the sham treatment. But with some procedures like ECT and some drugs as well, that's a real problem because of the side effects of the treatment. So you go into a treatment and you're saying, well, they told me it's a double blind, which means I might be getting the real treatment, I might be getting the sham treatment, I don't know which. And you're told also what the side effects of the treatment are. That's part of informed consent these days. Most of these uh, the ECT studies were old, old studies, and they did things in different way then, but now you tell them you may be getting the real uh, treatment, you might be getting the sham treatment, and you're told here are the side effects of the real treatment. And you know, if I was 
patient in one of these studies, I'd be wondering, gee, I wonder which group I'm in. Oh, wait a second, wait a second. With a drug like an antidepressant, you might say, oh, uh, wait a second, my mouth's dry. Oh, my mouth's dry. Oh, that's great, dear. That's one of the things they told me could happen if I got the real drug. That means I'm in the real drug group. Well, with ECT, the side effects are really strong. Oh, my gosh. I can't remember what happened last week. Oh, yeah. Wait, 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 wait. I can't remember what happened. Oh, oh, oh. That's because they gave me the electroshock treatment. Oh, oh, I really got the treatment. So that increases the expectation. And the stronger the expectation, the stronger the placebo effect, and therefore the stronger the response to the treatment. So you get responses to both the sham and the, 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 the genuine treatment. And with ECT, when you're looking at the long range effects, the sustained effects, there seems to be no difference at all. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm I'm guessing then so that you know the paper said that you know looking overall at the few studies and as you said I think there's only been 11 studies seven there that covered in the paper the performance of the sham procedure when compared to the actual procedure was very close and you know I'm guessing the placebo effect is the explanation for that. And the response to both of them were better than the response to real and sham antidepressant drugs which again is not surprising when you know how the placebo effect works and the fact that different placebos produce different size effects. And I think I'm, I'm curious, you and I have, have spoken in the past about antidepressants and placebo, and, and you know this is the first time I've seen you write about ECT. So wh- when you were reviewing the data and working on this with Laura and John, were you surprised about the conclusions or, or did it kind of confirm maybe what you expected to find? Well, I didn't really know. I didn't really know. I was not, I can't say I was surprised. I was surprised by the magnitude of the placebo effect, even though I should have expected that and, 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 and known that. But that, that was um, somewhat surprising uh, to me. Um, I did know about the negative effects from, from, from before, and I think that's part of what makes it very, very important. Again, I'm curious to know, I believe that placebo effects are quite unusually large in the area of mental health, you know, perhaps compared to to other areas of medicine. And, you know, I wondered if, firstly, does that go for all treatments in mental health? So be be it therapy or or medication or ECT or other things. And, you know, secondly, is there a reason why in mental health placebo is such a big factor? Okay. Yeah. One thing about that is that it's Large placebo effects can be found in a number of areas, not just in mental health. So physical pain, pain reduction is an area. It's probably the best research area of placebo effects uh, that, that there is. Irritable bowel syndrome is another. Parkinson's disease uh, is yet another one. So there are a number of areas. One of the things that all of them have in common is that they all involve subjective experiences, changes in in subjective experiences. It doesn't mean it's just self-report because we can also find the physiological, the neurological, the brain correlates of placebo effects, of expectancies, and of the effects that those expectancies uh, have. But they seem to be effective, particularly for uh, responses that have subjective components like anxiety, depression, pain, things of that sort. And one thing I would add is that specifically with depression, there's a reason why there ought to be. You can expect in advance of seeing the data that there should be a good size placebo effect, and that is that one of the characteristics of depression is a sense of hopelessness, a feeling of hopelessness. Things are bad. Maybe it's just my depression that's bad, but I don't think it's going to change. And that in itself is a depressing thought. When you're then given a new treatment, whether it be a drug, whether it be something else that's being investigated in a study, and we think this might be a particular use, something better than we've had before. Otherwise, why would we be you spending all this money 
doing uh, clinical trials to te test it out, that says, oh, maybe this will work. This instills a sense of hope that counters the hopelessness that's a core feature of depression. Yeah, absolutely. Given these questions about how large a, a role placebo might play in ECT, you know, what, what are your thoughts and reflections now, having done the work with John and Laura on the paper and, you know, come to the conclusions? You know, I just wondered what your reflections were on the use of ECT for either the severely depressed or, or the so called treatment resistant. My sense is that it ought to be prohibited, clear and simple. One of the reasons for that, that is that they have the, the negative effects are so strong. Second reason, there's no good evidence at all that they have any effect, especially in the long term, beyond the, the placebo effect. And third, there are other means. What that's telling you, when, when you get a placebo effect with a drug or a procedure or an operation or something about a physical inter intervention, what that's telling you is that this condition is amenable to psychological interventions. So not all psychological interventions are not all placebos, but placebos are psychological interventions. So you can think of my colleague, John Kelly, has said, well, placebos are a form of psychotherapy. Doesn't mean that psychotherapy is a placebo, but placebo is a type of psychotherapy. Well, I think, um, you know, as, as I talked about with John, I, I, there's been quite a strong reaction to the paper in the UK. You know, I, I hope in the US it's similar to, and, you know, I, I am so grateful for your work with John and, and with Laura to, you know, point out the paucity and the poor quality of evidence supporting this procedure. And I'm very grateful to you all for putting down on paper, I think, you know, something to provoke a discussion about this. And I'm particularly grateful to John for having taken the lead, organized it, done most of the work, and uh, for inviting me to be part of it, writing it up and looking at the stats and so on. Irving, thank you uh, for taking the time again. And, you know, I, I'm so fascinated by the placebo effect and all it can and can't do. And, you know, I was really interested to see this applied to ECT as a procedure. And, you know, I, I just thank you and John and Laura for all the work you did on the paper and uh, listeners will be able to I'll put a link to the paper so listeners can read the full thing and, and kind of make their own judgments. But thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much for a delightful interview and uh, for your kind words. And again, I have to thank John and Laura for inviting me to be a part of this. They're the ones who really deserve most of the credit. So I'd just like to thank both Irving and John for taking the time to chat for the podcast. If you'd like to read the original study we discussed, you can find a link on the post that accompanies this discussion on maddenamerica.com. And for more reading and context, you can also find a blog written by Professor Richard Benthall, which is available on the website of the Council for Evidence-Based Psychiatry, and it's titled ECT is a Classic Failure of Evidence-Based Medicine. So, as always, thank you for listening, and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates. 